Blessing over the offering this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all of that you do for us. Thank you, Lord, for showing us just how much you love us by shedding your blood and giving your life on the cross, Lord, to pay our debt for our sins. We thank you, Lord, that we're not in bondage of our sins and bound for hell anymore. We thank you, Lord, that our salvation is a gift we could never ever gain it on our own. We pray, Lord, you'll prepare our hearts for the preaching of your word today, and that you will help us, Lord, to empty us of us in this world that we live in. That you may fill us, Lord, with your word and with your will. Help us, Lord, to allow your word to work in us and through us, Lord, that we may be more like you. We ask, Lord, you'll just to help us to trust and obey, for there truly is no other way. Mm -hmm. We pray, Lord, if there's one among us in the need of salvation, today be the day they come to know you as their Savior. We pray, Lord, that we will glorify thy name with the songs we sing and the words that we sing. We ask, Lord, you'll take this offering, bless it, multiply it, use it for your kingdom, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, baby. See you.
<clears throat> you would, let's all stand together. Turn over to hymn number 224. 224.
think y'all may be seated. One turn over one more uh, this morning to hymn number 385. 385. Got a special for us? Come, Miss Linda. I was ready for another song. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, we got it. Yeah.
has it been since you knelt by your bed and prayed to the Lord up in heaven? How long since you knew that he'd answer you? Has it been since you woke with the dawn and felt that the days were the living? Can you call him your friend? How long has it been since you knew? That's a great challenge, amen. We don't persevere in prayer all too often. I remember the account, I was trying to remember the person where he said, if you would continue to pray for me until you break through. Uh, there's a lot of that, that need that we need to understand the power in prayer and just to be able to stay there until God answers. <clears throat> if you would, let's take your Bibles and go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Appreciate Brother Asher playing this morning, giving Sister Kim an opportunity. She wanted to be able to go around. And she's like, I, meet, I like to meet and greet. And by the time she's usually done with piano, the meet and greet's already gone. And, and, uh, and we have to discuss later, did you see them? Did you get to talk to them? Nope, nope, nope. So she was, she was so excited to be able to do that. And uh, so appreciate Asher stepping in and playing. And that's good experience too, amen? And looking forward to just seeing how the Lord continues to take those talents and grow those for Him. If you're able, let's stand together as we honor the reading of God's Word this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. And we'll begin looking in the very first verse. <clears throat> verse number 1 says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. I want to bring our message this morning of our ministry of the gospel, our ministry of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you so much for allowing us the great privilege of being able to gather together this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the hymns that have been sung. We thank you, Lord, for the passage of Scripture and how it speaks to our hearts. And Lord, as we come with the desire to be able to hear from you, I pray, God, that you would allow us to be uh, open to understanding what it is that you lay before us. Help us, Lord, to align our lives with your will and your word. Father, if there's one here that's never trusted Christ as Savior, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Lord, help us to be able to see the, the day and the hour that we're in. Help us to honor you in this time. We ask you to bless our time together. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated. This past Friday, uh, it was declared to be the National Day of Jihad. And I don't know if you watch the news or how much they even covered all of the events that, that took place and the things that are still going on. 
Uh, you kind of look at it and you say, well, what is jihad? Uh, it's a Muslim holy war for the intent of spreading Islam. Now, there's a couple of things whenever you start uh, diving into what that means, what jihad is. There is, uh, first of all, there's an inner spiritual battle, and that's the, the major thing that they uh, often emphasize. It's a battle against sinful behavior and things of that nature, uh, which is kind of ironic. But anyway, there's also the military sense of jihad, and uh, that's whenever you'll see uh, maybe people that are committing suicide while killing the infidels. And so what's an infidel? Anybody that's a non-Muslim, uh, predominantly Israel or the church. Uh, that's what 9-11 was. It was a matter of jihad. Uh, they, there's a hatred for Israel. Uh, there's a hatred for all those who support Israel. Uh, we think about this, or I was thinking about 9-11. This is 22 years ago. We were all appalled at the uh, terroristic act of, of uh, those that, that flew planes into uh, the buildings there, the World Trade uh, centers and and uh, and the events that that took place there, all in the name of of Allah, and yet just a few years later, uh, on this past Friday, there's universities in the United States that were supporting Jihad Day. Uh, those that were opposed to it were arrested. Uh, there there were names of Israeli students that were uh, enrolled in the school where the names were actually put on a display board on a bus and driven around the college so that. Uh, so that others of the college would be able to know who it was to be able to target. Uh, these are in major universities like Harvard. Uh, it's amazing to be able to think of the events that are going on. And that's, uh, that's in the United States. That's not counting those that were outside of the United States who were stabbed arbitrarily on the streets and, and things of that nature in different countries. I find it pretty amazing uh, to, to be able to bring all that up. I find it amazing at how quickly... Uh, there was such a response, such a gathering together for this time, this national day of uh, jihad. I mean, it was ready at a moment's notice. This wasn't something that was years ago that they said, all right, this is going to be the date. This is what it is that we're going to do. Uh, it was just at a moment's notice. One terrorist leader says, this is what we're going to do, national day of jihad. And then everybody starts gathering together. And, and, uh, and nobody thought that the cause or the means of which they uh, pursued their cause was unreasonable. Uh, there was nobody stepping up saying, it's not going to happen here. We're going to shut this thing down immediately. And this is not just in the United States. I saw uh, the streets of London were absolutely packed in the same, uh, same manner. Uh, but, but it's amazing to me to be able to see how quickly all of that was be able to gather together. And I started wondering why it is that God's people are so slow to gather together. I started wondering about that. And I'm not talking about protest. I'm talking about the assembly together to worship. Why is it that God's people often put off such a great need to worship the King of Kings. Here's the question of the day. What is our responsibility? More specifically, what is, God, what is our God-given responsibility as a child of God? What do you do whenever the, uh, whenever the honor that is supposed to be given toward the Lord Jesus Christ begins to be chiseled away? What do you do whenever the values that were once held and the securities that were once enjoyed are being threatened? We're going to see that in our passage of it. But what I want you to be able to come away with an understanding is there is a requirement for a great amount of spiritual maturity to be able to carry through what it is that God has given for us to do as his children. That's what the book of 2 Corinthians is all about. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul was writing a letter to the church at Corinth, and he was addressing sinful, sinful things that were in the church that should have never been there. He was addressing some of the most heinous things you could possibly imagine. And he said, uh, this is what you're doing, quit it. Uh, this is what you're doing, quit it. And, and he basically, he was giving them a choice. Uh, he said, if you're going to be called a church, he said, you can either get in line with the Word of God, or you can close your doors or quit calling yourself a church. I mean, that was to the, to the degree that was there. But he was presenting them that challenge of what it was that they needed to do personally uh, as people to be able to honor God. And guess what they did? They fixed it. Amen? Now, that goes a long way. I mean, that's a wonderful testimony. I, you know, I, I, I always think it's kind of ironic whenever somebody names himself like the, the First Baptist Church of Corinth, you know, a First Corinth Baptist Church. I'm like, no, <laughs> why, why would you do that? And yet by the end of 1 Corinthians, you see, they did the hard things. They made the changes that needed to be made, and, and they began to align themselves with uh, the Word of God. And then you get to 2 Corinthians. And so they're responding. There's been that challenge. He said, are you going to live for the, the carnal life? You're going to live a spiritual life. So, so they do what they're supposed to do. And in 2 Corinthians, he's 
writing to a church that did those hard things. And so they're very much maturing in their faith. And Paul begins to share through his own personal experiences in 2 Corinthians how it was that they could deal with different opposition, different kind of persecutions that would come against them all by the will of God. Uh, not only could they handle it, but they could be uh, comforted in the midst of opposition, in the midst of persecution. And not only that, they could be encouraged in the midst of trials. Can I tell you, that takes a real maturity. That takes truly a, a, a very high degree of spiritual maturity. Most of the time, under some kind of an opposition, our flesh begins to well up. Amen? There's a lot of things we can do with our flesh. So I'll tell you what I'd do. Right there, you're probably already stepping out on the wrong direction. Right? So how would God have for us to be able to handle certain situations in the midst of that? Today, uh, spiritual maturity seems to be a vanishing concept. It's not something that's high on people's radar. Uh, in the desire for uh, the, the time that we're in, everybody has this desire for personal relevance. We want to be relevant. And, and many have left behind the thought of what it means to be able to grow in Christ. Uh, the pursuit, many people, it's for our name to be lifted up. We're making our mark on this world. We want our story to be what it is that, that people are talking about. And there's a, uh, oftentimes there's a fear, a general fear of aligning our own hearts and minds in accordance with the Word of God. It takes maturity for that kind of pursuit to take, to take place. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse number 11, he says, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But then he said, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. What is he talking about? He says, uh, there's a call for maturity. He says, even though it may be where a lot of people are not considering spiritual maturity, there is a call for us in that regard. Uh, many think of that kind of maturity to be reserved for uh, your grandparents or the preacher. Amen. That's, that's kind of where that's supposed to be. So it's dismissed so that we can often just kind of pursue personal interest. So as Paul is penning this letter, he's sharing this need for people to be mature believers. Those who, who know a life for Christ should be pursued. Uh, they've determined that the life of sin is not what it is that's for them. And, and those that love the Lord, they, uh, they want other people to be saved as well. That, that requires a lot of maturity. Uh, can I tell you, personal holiness, the more that we, the, the more that we um, uh, live our life in accordance with the Word of God and we allow God's Word to be able to pre prevail in our hearts and our lives, and not just that, but to, to prevail in our actions, whenever you start thinking about that, that, that personal holiness, it never results in spiritual snobbery. Amen? The closer that you get to God, uh, it never leads you to talk less about the Lord Jesus Christ. The closer that you get to God, the closer that you start to see uh, God in your life, whenever you start comparing the Word of God to your own life, whenever you, whenever you come to the house of God and there's the preaching of the Word of God and you're saying, this is God's Word for me. Amen? Uh, it's not just something for, for later on. This is something for now. It's something for today. It's something that God has for me. The more that I take that and I take the Word of God and I begin to make it very personal in my life, and, and my life begins to, to magnify the cause of Christ, amazingly enough, that's when I'm going to witness. That's when I'm going to share a testimony. You know, what happens in the, the other direction is if we can hear the Word of God and we reject the Word of God, and we say, that's good for some people, preacher, but not for me. I've got my own life to be able to live. God can just take a back seat until I get old, or whatever the case. Then, then amazingly enough, you're not going to have a boldness or a desire to witness for the cause of Christ. It won't be something that is first in your life. The more that you realize God's grace, the more you want other people to know His love to know His forgiveness, to be able to share the mercy that's been extended to you. Those that are spiritually mature are going to want to humble themselves and serve as God leads. And so we get to this text that has uh, never been more needed than what it is right now today. I mean, boy, if you look at this, this is just absolutely the necessary cause that we have. And we hear Paul say in verse number three, <clears throat> but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. It's an appeal to the mature believer to see the importance of the hour. Uh, through all of the events of this day, I hope that we come away seeing the need of the hour. And not just the need so that we can talk about how bad the times are. The need for a believer to be able to stand firm on the Word of God, to have the maturity to put off the things of the flesh and say, I'll live for Christ. I want the Word of God to be high and lifted up. So we're going to see that just a little bit <clears throat> this morning. First thing, our ministry is the gospel. 
Our ministry is the gospel. You want to know uh, what your ministry is all about, what your life is all about? Well, I just need to know what the purpose of my life is. Here it is. It's the gospel. Amen. Uh, now, there's going to be some specific ways that God may uh, direct it that are going to be different or contrary to you know somebody else's, whatever the case. But but your goal, your ministry, it is the gospel that's been given to every person. So if you look in verse number one, he says, "Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, we have received mercy. We faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves." To every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Paul says, we have this ministry. And as such, we are not to faint in fulfilling that ministry. What does that mean? It means don't quit. We have the ministry for the cause of Christ. Don't quit. Keep going. Amen. There's, there must be a lot at stake for this ministry. So what is it specifically? Paul calls it out specifically in Acts 20 and verse 24. He says, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry, which I have received of the Lord Jesus, here's the ministry, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. That was the ministry that was given to the Apostle Paul. That was his ministry, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. You may be looking at that and you're like, man, I'm glad that was Paul's ministry and not mine. No, no, that's not what he says. You know, we, we need to look at this. Uh, look at what he says in verse number one. Therefore, seeing what? Yeah, we, you like to circle, underline, asterisk, and write in your Bible. Uh, that's a good one. Amen. Take a highlighter, put that little word we under highlights and look at that. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not. Who's this we business? Oh, surely that's talking about Paul and Barnabas. Surely that was Silas or maybe, uh, maybe Luke, you know, something, somebody that was walking with, uh, walking with Paul, and certainly it includes them, but that's not all. Verse 1 uh, goes on to say, as we have received mercy, we faint not. As you are a recipient of God's mercy and receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you have this ministry. This is your ministry. It's the ministry of delivering to others the gospel of the grace of God which you also have received. Every child of God should have this ministry. Verse number three says, it's our gospel. It's our gospel. But if our gospel be hit, uh, not Paul's gospel, amen, not the preacher's gospel, it's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that has been given to us. Who's us? Those who believe. If you've received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you have this ministry. What is the gospel? A lot of times people can misrepresent what the gospel message is. But the gospel is the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, uh, that is the gospel. Uh, nothing added to it, nothing taken away from it. Jesus said, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Turn back a page to your left over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and you'll see Paul actually detail uh, what the gospel is, and make sure that we understand what it's, what's there. Moreover, brethren, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, verse number 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I have preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Imagine that. You can believe something that's empty. Amen. We can all say, well, I believe. You can believe a lot of things. You can believe the earth is flat. You can believe we're floating through like a pancake. You know, whatever. Uh, but there's a lot of things that you can believe that are, that are wrong. Amen. He says, verse number three, some of you are like, well, I think, you know, talk to me later. Verse number three, he says, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also, what? Received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. Uh, what does it take for a person to be saved? Well, you got you to gotta go to church. Uh, you got to give. You got to give a lot to the church. Give to the poor also. You got to make sure that you're baptized four times. No, that's not what it is. How is a person saved? Well, the Bible says that we're, we've, uh, there's no righteousness in us. Amen? Uh, there's none righteous, no, not one. What does that mean? It means to be right with God, perfectly sinless. There's not a one of us. I, I guarantee if I went around the room, none of us would be able to say, you know, I think I am righteous. I think I've never sinned. That's usually the easiest thing in the world for somebody to understand. We are all sinned. Amen? We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because of that, the wages of sin is death. There is a repercussion for sin. 
Now, when we start looking at, at eternal life, we say, well, I want to go to heaven when I die. Obviously so. There's only two places you're going to go. You're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. Amen. Nobody in their right mind would ever want hell. Hell is a literal place. It is a place where the, uh, where the, the worm dieth not. The fire is not quenched. It's, uh, it's an eternal torment. The Bible is clear about it. Why is that? Because God doesn't want us to go there. Uh, he made sure that we didn't have to go there. Uh, hell was created for Satan and, and his followers. This wasn't created for you. Uh, and yet, to be able to go to heaven, it requires righteousness. And there's only two places that you can go. So what did God do? God gave salvation to us as a gift. You can't do enough good works to be able to earn your way into heaven. You, you can't go on your own name and on your own merit. We're sinners by nature. So Jesus, God in the flesh, came to this earth. He lived a perfect sinless life. He did what you and I could never do. He never sinned himself. Whenever he went to the cross, all of your sin, everything that you have ever committed, past, present, and future, was laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He died in your place. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, the Bible tells us that we've all sinned, and yet Jesus, in his great love, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In his great love, he went to the cross, and he died in your place. He took all of your sin, and all of the wrath of Almighty God was poured out upon the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, by his stripes, ye ye are healed. Amen. Uh, listen, salvation comes by a gift. He says, I'll take all the punishment. They put him in the grave, and guess what? He's not there anymore. Amen. Third day, he rose from the grave. Amen. We've got a risen Savior. That was the testimony that everything that Jesus came to do was sufficient, that it met the need of the Almighty God, that, that, uh, that his wrath has been paid for, that, that he, has, uh, he has already taken all of that wrath upon himself. You don't need to. If you go to hell, it'll be because you chose to reject the Savior. He says, I will give you salvation. You recognize you're a sinner. Jesus is the Savior, not that of yourselves. You, you ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin and to be your personal Savior. What are you doing? I'm trusting in the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not about my merit. It's not about my goodness. It's not about my baptism. It's all about Jesus. Amen. That's how you can know that you have eternal life. Whenever I put my trust in Him, and not that, listen, if I was trusting in my, myself, I'd be lost today. I'd be lost tomorrow. I'd be losing it the next 30 minutes. I'd be thinking something wrong. I'd be doing something wrong. I'd be losing my salvation. But it's not you hanging on to Jesus. God said, whenever you receive Christ as Savior, He says, I'm holding on to you. He says, you are my child. You're not a child of the devil anymore. You're a child of the King. He says, I'll give you that gift. You know, the hard part of people is receiving that gift. Because in our mind, we think, well, preacher, I'm going to come to church. Well, I got some things I got to iron out first in my life. Can I go ahead and tell you, you will never iron out those things in your life by your own flesh. It's your flesh that got you in those problems to begin with. Listen, it, it takes God to be able to work in you and through you. And he's not looking for you to come perfect. If so, if, if there was something that you could do to be able to come to God in your own perfection, he would not have had to send his only begotten son to die on the cross for you. If salvation could be attained by your own merit, Jesus wouldn't have had to die. Amen. But he did. And he did not withhold his only son. Why? He loves you. He loves you. He doesn't want sin to ruin your life. He wants you to know the victory that comes through Christ. The gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection. <clears throat> the Son of Man has come to seek and to save them that were lost. Now Paul said, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that I also received. The Apostle Paul said, uh, I had to receive salvation as well. I had to receive God's grace as well. I received his mercy as well. And he says that that ministry that I'm delivering to you, I had to receive it as well. The same gospel that was received of the Saul of Tarsus that, that changed his life from being a persecutor of Christians, the church, and Christ, and made him to be a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It's the same gospel that's available to us. You know, Paul never really got over that. Amen. 
Romans 1, verse number 16, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He says, to everyone that believeth. Remember, you can believe things that are false. What does it mean to believe in the Bible? It means to put all of your trust and hope in the truth of the Word of God. If you want to be saved, it's not going to be because you turned over a new leaf or because you've got an idea that's better than God's. It's because you have received that gift personally, by faith, of Jesus of being your personal Savior. Paul stated very plainly that he was, he was not going to allow any manner of shame to hide the gospel of his witness. He charges the believers in Corinth with the same thing. Verse number three, he says, if our gospel be hid, if our gospel, he's telling him it's, it's possible for our gospel to be hid. That's amazing because how in the world could we possibly hide the very glory of God that was given to us by his mercy and by his grace in our personal salvation? Well, if you back up just a little bit in chapter four, verse number one, what's the very first word that says there? Therefore, that therefore, of course, is referencing all the events that were taking place in chapter number three. Now, it's pretty interesting what he does here. He goes back in chapter three and, and, uh, and he begins to talk about Moses. And he talks about Moses whenever Moses was able to get the, uh, those two tablets of stone and, uh, and the, the Ten Commandments. And he was bringing those down. He said, after being in the presence of God for that amount of time, his face shone so bright that the people were running scared. And that's what Paul is, is bringing back up to their, their memory. He says they, they wouldn't even hear what he had to say. They looked at him, they're like, ah, you know, and, and so they're running. And, and so he says, listen, if you'll listen to me, he says, I'll put a veil over my face so that you won't be afraid of what it is that I'm sharing with you. Now, in verse number 12 of chapter 3, it says, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly Look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. He said there's, there's something that's just kind of covering over their heart. Their heart's not open to what it is that's being spoken. Verse 16, he says, nevertheless, when it, uh, talking about the heart, shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Paul said, our ministry is not like that of Moses. He says, Moses, he was given the law. What did the law do for anybody? It brought condemnation. It showed that a person could never be justified by the law. That was the purpose of the law. The purpose of the Ten Commandments is to show you that you never, can never keep the Ten Commandments. The Bible says over in Galatians 3 and verse number 24 that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. We are to receive Christ as Savior. Uh, he's the only one who has actually fulfilled all the law. Amen. So, so Paul said, our ministry is not like that. We're not bringing condemnation. He says, our ministry is that of the grace of God that brings life through the Lord Jesus Christ. Through Christ, that veil is removed from the heart. Instead of condemnation, he says, man, we don't have that. We've got a ministry of liberty. We've got a ministry of hope. We've got a ministry of love whenever we have the ministry of the gospel. That said, how could we ever want that glory to be hidden? How could we ever want the grace of God that has been so manifest in our life to be able to give us eternal life in heaven? And not, not to go shine any light upon ourselves, but, but to turn people's eyes to Christ. How could we ever want that to be hidden? Have you ever considered what it takes for your gospel witness to be hid? It doesn't really take a whole lot. Matter of fact, over there in verse number two, he says, we've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. There's three things that'll hide the gospel witness in your life. Dis, uh, dishonesty, craftiness, deceitful handling of the Word of God. Those are the things that, that, it, that uh, can take away that influence of the gospel. We all have that gospel witness, that gospel ministry that we're supposed to maintain. Now the time is different than it was in Paul's day. Guess what? It's the same gospel, amen. Paul had a distinct purpose in his ministry. Now there's different times. Uh, as you look at the life of Paul, his ministry kind of took on different shapes, didn't it? It wasn't always just the exact same thing. 
If anything, man, Paul's ministry, it was just constantly moving. Someday he was going to be a teacher over at the church of Antioch. And he's, uh, he's establishing a church, a church planner. There's other times he's on a missionary journey. Uh, sometimes he's on the ground being stoned. Sometimes he's uh, at sea. He's at shipwreck. And all these different events that are happening all the time. But his goal was always the same to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He felt that, that he was the least of all the saints. And yet he said back in Romans chapter 1 that we just said, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He would not be ashamed of the gospel. And uh, God had entrusted that ministry to him. That means that Paul would have to trust that God knew more than he knew. Amen. Amen. God was in control of all these things. One of the things that causes our ministry to be hidden, it's an improper view of ourselves. It's an improper view of ourselves. We look at our inability rather than God's enabling, rather than God's might. God has entrusted the ministry of the gospel to each one of us, just like he did to the apostle Paul. So that say it's a mature Christian that will recognize those who are lost in need of the gospel. What is the God? The good news of the savior. Amen. The salvation is available and reach them for the cause of Christ. Secondly, there is an outside enemy to our ministry. We've got a great ministry, amen? Great ministry of the gospel. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not everybody's excited about that. It should be that the child of God is excited about it, amen? But not everybody's excited. There are enemies to the gospel. Look at verse number four. He says, in whom the little g God of this world, who's that? Everybody say, Satan, you got the right answer? Amen. That's most of you. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Whenever Satan is at work, he has a main goal as well. His main goal is for the light of the glorious gospel of Christ to be hidden to those who are lost. You know, Satan cannot take away your salvation. Amen. He can't do that. He, he can't do anything about your salvation, but he can do what he will to be able to keep that veil on the hearts of those who are lost. If the gospel is what delivers the souls of men from hell, and it is, what does he have to do? Stop the spread of the gospel. Yeah. Amen. Easy enough. Just stop the spread of the gospel. We, you know, we could all put together a list of events that are successful at, at that endeavor, what it takes to be able to stop the gospel. It's easy. Amen. Uh, rain. Um, Friday, Saturday, Thursday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday are pretty, pretty much off. Sunday's a course, you know. We, we, we can make this whole list of different things that, that would stop us from being able to share the gospel. But you know what Satan deals in? Things like disappointment, disillusionment, distraction. Oh, that's all it is. Just keep the veil in place. That's all. I'm always amazed at the number of distractions that happen whenever you have an opportunity to be able to present the gospel to somebody. Has that ever happened to you? You got the word of God open, you're going through, somebody actually wants to hear the gospel. And then all of a sudden the dog starts barking. Uh, the phone starts ringing. Uh, there's, a, there's a cousin that hadn't been seen in 35 years, just disappeared. And now all of a sudden they show up at the doorstep on that day. You know, it's like, how in the world did you get here? Listen, what's the, what's the interest? Keep the veil on. Keep the veil on. Listen, uh, God wants that veil to be removed. When a person receives Christ, and in fact, whenever we share Christ, you know what it is? It is a testimony not of ourselves. It's a testimony of the power of God. It's the power of God to be able to give that testimony. It's the power of God whenever that testimony is received as truth, the word of God. Notice what it says in verse number five. You still awake? Say amen. amen. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. I love that. You know what keeps you in the ministry of service? Jesus. It's Jesus. Amen. It's for his sake. You see, the, the spiritual maturity that we need to persevere against all opposition, it's not a product of your age. It's not a product of your position, your job description. It's, it's a result of the position of your heart. It's the closeness that you are to the Lord himself. Many people live their whole life and never grow in the grace of God, never submit to the will of God. The things that really matter in this life, it's your relationship with Jesus. That's it. That's it. And it's through that that you're going to be instrumental in being able to reach the world for Christ. If our relationship with the Lord is that important, 
I mean, if we, if we look at it and we say, you know, I, in this day, here it is. So I wish the preacher would wrap it up. Here it is. How's your relationship with Christ? If it's what it should be, amen. Well, what's it should be? Uh, we've been talking about it. If it's what it should be, by the way, you know, you don't need me to tell you. I know my closeness to the Lord or my distance from the Lord. You know your closeness to the Lord or your distance from the Lord. You know. I don't have to point it out. That's between you and God. And the Holy Spirit does a lot better job than I ever could in my life. Amen? But it's one of those things whenever God begins to show, He's like, you're not as close as you think you are. What? What's the effect? The gospel ministry. The closeness to Christ. The the fullness of the Spirit, the, 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 the direction of God's leading in your life. Our ministry, whenever the Lord, uh, when our relationship with the Lord is what it should be, when it's as strong as it should be, our ministry is always going to be fruitful. It's always going to be expanding. Why? Because that's what God wants. Amen? God doesn't want any of us to be able to say, you know, my whole life is just stagnant and dull. I mean, I just never see God working. I don't have any testimonial. That's not God's will, amen? No, no. Uh, but who's the one? God's not the one that stiff arms us. He doesn't keep us back. He's like, I don't want to work through it. That's why we're here. So if there's distance between us and God, who made it? We did. You have the decision. You get to choose how close you are to the Lord. Amen? Amen? Whenever we start to say, well, you know, I've got some things I've got to deal with. I just, I'm hanging on to this sin for a little while. What are you saying? I'll keep the distance between me and God. And you know what's going to happen? Our gospel is hid to them that are lost. When the Lord ascended to heaven, he gave us that task. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. And lo, I'm with you all the way even unto the end of the world. Can I tell you, Jesus is coming back. Amen? Now this is one of the things whenever we start thinking about Israel and there's war in Israel, well, preacher, give me a date. All right. Um, let's pretend it's this afternoon. Is it? I don't know. By the way, anybody that tells you that is wrong. Amen? But shouldn't we be looking for the Lord's return? I mean, how much boldness uh, should, should, there, should there be all these great signs and wonders and things and all this kind of stuff that's happening to be able to really get our attention? Isn't the Word of God sufficient? Yes. You know, uh, whenever that, uh, we got that account of the rich man and Lazarus and, and, uh, and the rich man was there in hell and he said, just, just send somebody back from the dead to be able to talk to my brothers. Remember what Abraham said? He says, no, he's got the, he's got the Word of God. If they're going to listen, they'll listen to the Word of God. Can I tell you the same advice holds true for us? Well, what kind of sign do we need? Amen? We have the complete perfect Word of God. Amen. If that's not sufficient to be able to stir our hearts for the cause of Christ, don't look for anything else. Jesus is coming back, and whenever He does, we're going to have to give an account of all the things that He has entrusted to our care. We're going to give an account for all the freedoms that we have and how it was used. How do we serve whenever we have enemies about? We've got an enemy. We've got an enemy that just wants the gospel to stop. Amen. He just wants the veil to stay on somebody's heart. He wants your lost neighbor to not know about Christ. He wants to give you an opportunity to speak. And yet, uh, and yet Satan says, no, no, not today. There's going to be something. Else. How do we serve whenever the enemy is there? I'll give you a couple of things. First of all, keep the re return of Jesus in your heart and mind. Keep that return of Jesus in your heart and mind. We are going to give an account. Amen? We're going to give an account of, of the life that we lived. How did we steward our life and opportunities? Truly, there's a lot of days where the return of Christ does not cross my mind. I think you would probably say the same. That's the way it is. There's a lot of things, boy, it gets busy. You want to keep that gospel witness going? Keep that return of Christ on your mind. Recognize those, secondly, recognize those that are around you that need to hear the gospel. They need to hear the gospel. Now, this is preaching to me as much as anybody else. Look past being offended and recognize that there's people that need to hear about Jesus. Now, there are certain things that offend me. I've shared this with you before. i got just a minute. <clears throat> Whenever I take my family out and somebody's using profanity, 
right beside me. Man, I'm telling you, there is a major battle with my flesh right there. It really is. Boy, that just, that burns me up. It really does. I'm just being, I'm confessing my unspirituality to you. But on the other side of that, somebody needs Jesus. Whenever we look at somebody's lifestyle, and we're like, I can't believe it. I can't either. But they need Jesus. Amen? Look beyond it. Third, every day ask the Lord to give you an opportunity to share Christ. Amazingly enough, whenever we make that a point of prayer, whenever it's so important to us that we just want other people to know Jesus, and we say, Lord, would you just give me an open door to be able to talk to somebody about Christ? Not as a talking point, amen. Sometimes we pray that and we just say it because it sounds cool. Lord, give us a good open door. Well, guess what? He already has. Maybe we should pray, Lord, let me see the open door that you present before me. Let me, let me recognize whenever I'm standing there in the grocery line with somebody that needs Christ. Let me, whenever you're pumping gas beside somebody else and you're just staring at each other awkwardly. Make it a little more awkward, amen? Ask them if they're going to hell when they die. <laughs> now, anyway, but, but just pray and say, Lord, give me an opportunity to be able to share the gospel. Every day I ask. Number four, live your life with joy. Live your life with joy. You know, one of the reasons that we're often ineffective in sharing Christ with somebody is the sour look that we often keep on our own face. Amen? So I don't have that. You preach. Amen. Sometimes that mark is just on our face. How's your joy? How's your joy? It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not something you have to drum up, by the way. It's like, oh man, here we go. Everybody starts smiling around. The no, you, you don't have to drum it up. It's just a joy of the Lord. You know, that's something you can pray about. It, it's okay to be able to come to God and say, Lord, I just don't really have that joy that I used to. Lord, would you stir that fresh in my life? Our ministry is the gospel. We've got an enemy to the ministry. And thirdly, there is a godly peace in our ministry. Look at what he says in verse number 6. He says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. If this ministry that, that, that we have been given does not reveal the character of the Lord, and reflect the shine of, of the face of our Savior, you know what? We're not doing it right, are we? No, we should be reflecting the glory of God in our life. And the character of the Lord, what do we see? What do we see? There's a lot of things we could say. I'll keep it short. First off, we see humility. Remember Jesus, he's the one who humbled himself. He humbled himself to leave heaven, to be born of a virgin and be raised in a carpenter's home, not in a palace. We see uh, uh, the character of his desire to be growing. Remember whenever he was 12 years old, he was in the temple just astounding people with the understanding that he had. We see his compassion and that he, he went to the cross at Calvary very selflessly dying for our sin. We see his victory whenever he rose from the grave. You know, those are characteristics that we should have in our own ministry. Our gospel to be able to share the life and the character and the love of our Savior who lived and died and rose from the grave to be able to give eternal life should be in our hearts as well. That brings us to this matter of verses 8 through 10. Now look at it real quick. <clears throat> We're troubled on every side yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. You know, as we look around, we see, uh, man, what, what happened? National Jihad Day. Who let that one go? I mean, man, who was in charge that day? Who said that that was going to be okay on the college grounds? Who was it that gave out the names of people on the side of a bus that shouldn't have ever been targeted? They're just going for an education, supposedly. Listen, oh, why is all these things, why do these things happen? And we start to wonder, we start looking at the troubling, and with all the troubling and confusion and persecution that, that occurs all around us, we have confidence that God is still in control. God can still get the glory, hey man? It's our need to be able to see, hey, where are we as a Christian? What about the cause of Christ? Why is it that God's people are slow to be able to stand for Jesus? Oh, don't let anybody uh, quench your spirit. Amen. 
Don't let that veil remain on the hearts of those that you love. They need to hear about Christ. Amen? Share that wonderful gospel message. We have a responsibility. We have a responsibility just like Moses had whenever he came down the mountain. Amen? He didn't, listen, Moses didn't sit off on the side of the mountain somewhere and say, well, when the, when the glowing quits, then I'll go down and share the message that God has given to me. No, he says, I'll put the veil on because the message is so important. Amen? Whenever we start looking at our own lives, oh, I'll witness whenever it gets colder. It's colder. <laughs> I'll witness whenever it's, you know, just a little bit farther along in the weeks. Farther along in the week. I witness whenever I get all my ducks in a row. You'll never witness. <laughs> now, whenever the cause of Christ is seen so high, we'll follow through with our ministry of the gospel. We have a responsibility. Now, if Moses had that responsibility and he saw it through to be able to carry the law, the Ten Commandments that bring condemnation to the people, how much more should we that know the very grace of God that sets a person free from the condemnation, how much more should we desire to reach those with the gospel? Let me ask you, has the humility and the love and the assurance that comes through Christ so gripped your heart today that you cannot help but tell other people the message of salvation. What about you? If you died today, would you go to heaven? Has there ever been a place where you knelt down and received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Has there ever been a time where you recognized that you were a sinner, and because of your sin you'll never be able to attain heaven on your own, but you recognize Jesus and His sacrifice, that whenever he came to the cross at Calvary that he died for your sin, and that he rose again from the grave. He was victorious over death, hell, and the grave. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father. He's making intercession for us. He's asking for those that will recognize their lost state to receive that gift of his righteousness to be applied to their account. Is that you? If you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want to invite you today. What a great day to have your sins forgiven. What a great day to be away from that, the bondage of Satan and be on the winning side of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's all stand together. We're going to have a hymn of invitation. This is the day to be able to stand for your ministry, for the cause of Christ. Maybe it is that you need to come today and just ask God to help you to stand. Of all of the opposition, listen, if somebody can stand for something that is ungodly, we can certainly stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your love and blessings. Thank you for your grace and goodness. Thank you, Lord, for the gospel. Thank you, Lord, for the power that we have over death and hell that's available through Christ. Lord, I pray, Father, that we not trust in ourselves. Lord, we not lean upon our own understanding, that, but, Lord, that we would wholly lean upon the name of Christ. Lord, if there's one here that doesn't know Jesus as Savior, they've never had a day that they've actually confessed that they're a sinner, that Jesus is the Savior. And by your grace, receive him as Savior. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would give them that understanding. And Lord, help them to respond to you in this hour, at this moment, as we begin to sing. And Lord, for each of us, I pray, God, that we would be able to see the great, important ministry that we have. We pray, Lord, that you would get the glory of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hymn number 286. 286.